Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, OT Cybersecurity, Securing Your Industrial Operations. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited today to be a part of today's webcast. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it's turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentations will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the help widget, which is the question mark icon on your console and covers most technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session during the last part of the presentation, should time permit. And feel free to submit comments via this widget as well. For downloadable PDFs and the slide deck pertinent to today's discussion, click on the resource widget. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast and the slide deck. Okay, so let's get on with the presentation. A bit about our speakers. Our guest presenter today is Jim McCarthy, who is a senior security engineer at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, NCCOE, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. He currently serves as the federal lead for energy sector projects. Mr. McCarthy joined the NCCOE in 2014 after serving at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He also worked in various cybersecurity roles at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Our other speaker is Robert Landavazzo. He is a senior systems engineer at Tripwire, where he focuses on helping customers secure their industrial control systems. He has a background in the electric utility sector, most recently working to implement a NERC Critical Infrastructure SIP internal compliance program leveraging Tripwire's own product suite. For more information on both speakers, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your console. Now, without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Jim McCarthy. Take it away, Jim. Uh, thank you, Kate. I appreciate that. Good day, everyone. My name is Jim McCarthy, and as Kate mentioned, I'm with the NIST National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a background of exactly what we do, but me in particular, as part of the NIST NCCOE, uh, we're heavily engaged in cybersecurity for industrial control systems, and in my particular sectors, energy and manufacturing. So we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, giving you some background, talking about some projects that we're undertaking or have undertaken in the past, and then uh, we'll do some question and answering uh, later on in the presentation. So thank you for uh, joining us, and uh, thanks to Tripwire for having me today. That being said, I'm going to move on to the first slide here, a little bit of a background on us here at the NCCOE. We started, oh, just, just again to clarify, we're part of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. So we are part of the federal government. But this center in particular, about six years ago, was stood up to address the needs of industry directly. And what we mean by that is basically we are put into place to solve cybersecurity problems in various sectors or, or solve cybersecurity problems that are uh, preeminent across industries. And, and there can be any number of them. And that's, that's important to remember here. Uh, as we move forward. Again, I work with particular focus on industrial control systems and even more uh, specifically uh, for energy and manufacturing. Our mission is really rather simple, is to accelerate the adoption of secure technologies. And how we do that, how we go about that, that's uh, part of the story here as well. So we collaborate with tech providers. Uh, we have communities of interest that we engage with to generate these ideas. Again, all with uh, the mindset of serving industry at the end of the day with these cybersecurity solutions or builds that we implement here in our labs. Um, a little background in terms of where we stand, where the NCCOE stands in terms of overall NIST. 
Note that NIST is uh, parsed basically into individual laboratories. We are part, uh, or the NCCOE is part of the NIST Information Technology Laboratory. And uh, if you're looking at the slide, look over to the left, our programs, advanced networking and things like that. Cybersecurity is a big one. Um, some of you may know NIST for uh, encryption and, and some of these uh, areas of subject matter expertise that we have. Um, but specifically today, we're going to be talking about NCCOE in terms of ITL in cybersecurity. And we collaborate with industry, federal, state, local governments, and of course, academia. Okay, so enough about that. I'm going to tell you here how we go about, or how at least my sector goes about engaging directly with industry. So first, um, when we have an idea for a particular um, challenge or cybersecurity problem that exists, um, we will engage directly with members of industry. In my case, it's going to be the utilities and, and folks who have uh, manufacturing uh, implementations, robotics, process control, things like that. So we will engage with them directly and basically ask them, what are your most prevalent cybersecurity problems? And this is basically the definition stage. So once we get all that feedback, we uh, and just, just to, to remind you of one thing, everything we do here is transparent. So the process that I'm describing here, um, we publish all sorts of information on our website, which is accessible by anybody. So getting back to the definition phase, we define the problem. Um, we enlist and engage the resources to address that problem. Tripwire is a great example of this. So we collaborate directly with companies like Tripwire and many others uh, to do perform the build or we assemble this team to actually solve the problem. We don't develop any of our own software or products or anything of that, but we do organize, define, and assemble the team necessary to serve industry's needs. The build itself, that will typically occur in NCCOE's labs. So we build a practical, usable, repeatable solution, um, whatever we've agreed upon uh, in order to, to get that out to industry. And we do that in the form of what we'll call next is advocate, and that's basically in the form of a practice guide. The practice guide is actually the end result of all the work that we had done uh, to solve this particular problem. Again, I will get to examples a little later on as to exactly what those problems are, um, but this background is important. So this, as I was saying, this is the practice guide. This is actually the composition of, of all the work that we had undertaken um, based on the project. So we have our own special pub designation, which there it's abbreviated as SP. Our series of special pubs here at the NCCOE is designated as 1800. In my case, I did 1800-2, Identity and Access Management, and 1800-7, Situational Awareness, as an example. And what you'll typically find in these volumes or publications, uh, they're typically um, split up into three different parts. The first is the executive summary, where we target C-suite executives and let them know uh, what we've determined or what we've gleaned from our, our uh, outreach as to what exactly the problem is. This gives them a, a, a good over, overview of how we're helping to define the problem. Volume B is the approach, the architecture, security characteristics, everything we did or brought to bear uh, to be able to um, create the cybersecurity solution uh, that is identified in these guides. And then volume C, the how-to guide. This is what probably differentiates uh, our pubs uh, more than anything else is that we actually provide the installation configuration and even integration guidance right there in that volume C. So anybody uh, at any ent entity, uh, let's say a utility, will be able to look at this, look at the executive level approach to it, um, the managerial level, which would probably be part B, and then the actual engineering or implementation level, which is, which is volume C. And we thought that would be best uh, the best way to serve the community in this case. And we focus on technology. Uh, by no means we have we focus on process or procedure. That's basically up to the policy level folks um, in industry themselves. This slide is here to give you an example of some of the companies we partner with in the industrial control system space. You'll see a few on here. Um, Tripwire being one of them, but these people, this group of, of companies here are folks who have signed on with the NCCOE to offer 
a consistent and constant level of support with hardware, software, and subject management expertise in all in all different types of uh, implementations. So, um, just just as an example, for me, I have Drago Security, OSI Soft, Tripwire, TDI, uh, all who bring uh, a lot to bear to the industrial control system cybersecurity space. And you can see there are many others as well. This is by no means uh, a limitation of the companies that we will engage with on any of these projects. In fact, each project. Um, is, is uh, we bring companies on via direct solicitation, uh, so we choose companies um, based on their response to our request for collaboration on any of the projects that, uh, uh, that we are undertaking at any given time. Tenants, uh, this is how NCCOE, we define uh, how we want our approach to projects to be. So we're standards-based, and that could mean a lot of different things, but in this case, it's going to mean, you know, we have to understand that there are already pre-existing compliance standards out there that we have to comport to or take into consideration when we're writing our guides. We don't want to replace or usurp uh, any, any uh, type of compliance guidance that's already out there for a particular industry. And there's also tech-based standards, and NIST has a lot of these things in terms of encryption standards uh, and acceptable levels of encryption, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's essentially what is meant by standards-based modular. Typically, when we're uh, building one of these projects or building out one of these projects, I should say, um, they are a solution as a whole, but there are many different pieces and components that would-be adopters can, can look at and hopefully adopt on a modular level where they don't have to rip and replace their infrastructure uh, in order to implement some of the, uh, the better parts of the solution as according to the way they see it. Repeatable, that's a simple scientific term. By virtue of publishing this guide, anybody who uh, would try in their own lab to, to replicate exactly what we did should be. So we validate whatever we do um, consistently and every time we, we put out one of these practice guides, of course, with some of the environmental nuances that we have here. Commercially available, this is very important. We cannot engage with any company out there who does not have a commercially available um, product on the market. So anytime we select collaborators uh, for one of these builds or projects, we make sure that they have a product that can be purchased at the time that uh, they sign on with us. And that's really important because we're not doing any forward-looking research or not dealing with companies trying to help them develop uh, some of the stuff they may have in beta. So that's an important thing to keep in mind usable, that's self-explanatory, and then open and transparent. As I mentioned earlier, um, basically everything that we're doing here is open and transparent to the public. Most of what we do on a project is published, even, even uh, in terms of meetings that we have and the minutes from those are, are published on our website as well. So this is uh, anybody who wants to keep up with what we're doing at any given time is able to do that. Sector-based projects, I just I put this slide in here to give an example of some of the spaces that we're working in. You'll see energy and manufacturing up there. Again, those are mine. Certainly not limited to that at all. We have commerce, retail, financial services, hospitality, et cetera, et cetera. And again, all the information on those uh, sectors is available on our website as well. My projects, as I mentioned before, these two are currently available in draft form on our website, Identity and Access Management. That constituted a heavy focus on pre-provisioning and deprovisioning uh, of IT, OT, and uh, physical access control, access management. Situation awareness is also published, and that was a heavy focus on the different capabilities available um, to folks that need them uh, in, in terms of uh, real-time monitoring and disposition of all the assets um, in a typical energy setup, so to speak. So we took into account not just IT, uh, but we did a heavy emphasis on OT or operational technology and, of course, physical access control as well. Here's one of the projects that we actually are launching as we speak. We just sent out our request for collaboration on this on Monday of this week. So that was the 26th and it's energy sector asset management, and this is a brand new project, as I mentioned, and it took about uh, six to eight months to get it to this point, but we focus on asset management capability for the energy sector. Again, we uh, had 
heavy engagement with them in terms of what they wanted to see from us uh, in terms of a project such as this. Uh, so we include electric utilities, oil and gas, and any other subsector that would like to participate. We wanted to have as broad a reach as possible on this one. Uh, so there's a chance that renewables or nuclear may even join in here and, uh, and, and help us out and, and help guide the project as we, as we go through it or, or start to build it, actually. Additional and specific focus is giving to remote and geographically dispersed assets. From what we understood, this was a huge challenge out in the industry. You can imagine there's a lot of assets out there that are not easily accessible. Uh, and that, was, that is one of the focuses we have on this. What exactly we're going to do about that, we don't know right now. We're very early on in the development stage on it. We should have our collaborators selected by, I would say, late March, April. Um, we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of requests to, part, to collaborate on this from uh, a great many uh, potential vendors out there. And I've also included in this slide a website which will take you to the project description. That's basically um, gives folks an idea as to what we'll be doing on any given project uh, that we published, and uh, that can be directly accessible via that link, and you can read it yourself um, if you're interested in it. In the manufacturing side, we currently have a project uh, we're doing with behavioral anomaly detection. This is a little bit of a different uh, animal here in that we're focusing on a single capability. Uh, it's a collaboration between another um, NIST lab, the engineering laboratory, and our information technology, information technology lab. So we leverage existing robotics and process control infrastructure. The folks up there at the engineering lab already have one of these built, so we can just take these cybersecurity tools, implement them, test them, see how they perform, and write about it in the form of a practice guide. Again, this is our first one we've done in manufacturing. Uh, we had the kickoff uh, last July, and we project that we will have a practice guide or one of these SP1800s released in June of this year. So that should be forthcoming here within the next three months or so. And again, there's a link if you want to find out more about that particular project. And finally, just some contact information. Uh, again, I can't emphasize enough that the NCCOE is open and collaborative, and uh, we encourage people to get in touch with us ask us questions, present us with ideas. There's many, many ways to do that. This is my own contact information here. Feel free to use it. Um, I also suggest, highly suggest, uh, the link there to the lower left, nccoenisp.gov. There's great information on the landing page, and then uh, as you drill into the projects pages and whatnot, there's a lot of information there uh, that folks can glean, hopefully, to improve cybersecurity in their own organizations. And with that, Rob, I'm done with my part of the presentation. It's, uh, I can hand it over to you now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks for the introduction to the NCCOE. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I learned quite a bit uh, in just the past 20 minutes. So um, we, we did get one question for you that I think you did a fantastic job of, of already answering, but I'd like to perhaps have you address it anyway. Um, it looks like it's coming from uh, a cybersecurity vendor, and they're expressing interest in collaborating with you on potential ICS security topics and wanting to know how to go about doing that. Um, and, you know, you did on the deck provide uh, your contact information, but maybe if you could just briefly describe the, the process by which uh, a potential vendor would go about um, expressing their interest in collaboration. Yeah, sure. Glad to. Um, it can come simply, Rob, in the form of an email to me, and then I can give instructions out. But for the sake and purposes of this call, it's kind of a multi-stage process, right? So we prepare all the requisite documentation needed for people to know that a collaborative, collaborative opportunity is even available. So when I had that slide up for energy sector asset management, the release of that project description is really a precursor for the open call for collaboration. So and this is important. It's a little bit of government speak, so bear with me, but this is the way we do it and it's the way it needs to be done to make sure that the, the playing field is, is open to everybody. We publish a federal register notice and that, even though that information is not on this slide, that's exactly what we did on Monday, the federal register which is part of OMB, 
Um, we prepare the documentation necessary to make this request for cap collaboration. And our federal register, you go to federal register, federalregister.gov and just type in the find bar uh, NCCOE and you will probably see energy sector asset management as the first hit there. And uh, subsequent to that, you read through the instructions and it gives you specific instructions to request a letter of interest, what to fill it out, sign it, et cetera, et cetera. But for all intents and purposes, that's the main way that uh, tech vendors who are interested in collaborating at this moment um, can get involved and there's other mechanisms as well. We, we host, uh, we have an energy provider community which on average meets about once per month to discuss projects, future, upcoming, generate new ideas, review projects, uh, critique them even at times, and uh, that can all be done uh, via outreach. So feel free to send me an email after this and we will make sure that one way or another um, what you're requesting is addressed. Great, Jim, thank you. Uh, another question came in here for you that it, uh, really goes along the same lines. Um, the question is, the collaboration opportunity is limited only to U.S. companies or can international companies participate? Very good question. So if, if everyone recalls the slide that I showed earlier on the National Cybersecurity Excellence Partnership, NCEPs, those are limited to only U.S.-based companies. However, in terms of individual project collaboration that's open to anybody. In fact, I've had companies from Norway, I've had companies from Israel, France, a uh, couple of Japanese companies, we've had them from all over the world, mainly the U.S., but yeah, those individual project collaborations are open to any country. Fantastic. Thanks, Jim. Sure. So. I wanted to uh, take this time now to uh, bounce some questions off you uh, that may or may not have, have been addressed as part of your presentation and uh, kind of just have an, an open conversation um, regarding the NCCOE. So without further ado, um, my first you know, statement perhaps is uh, or a quote from Ronald Reagan. And uh, he said, you know, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, you know, one of the most terrifying sentences in the, the English language, of course. Um, so that being said, uh, what difference differentiates the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence from a government body standards writing or an enforcement body, so to speak? Oh, great, great question. I'm glad you asked it because this is one of the points that I always try to emphasize, and that's you're, you're not dealing with um, – in terms of the NCCOE, you're dealing with an organization that was stood up directly to open up the lines of communication with industry. Why? Because it's definitely in government's best interest and in the private sector's best interest uh, to secure their assets. So this group of people here as part of NIST was stood up specifically for that purpose, and our facility is designed that way. Our lines of communication are completely open. Um, and we are non-regulatory. I can't emphasize that enough. I worked at regulatory agencies in the past, and this is uh, very far away from that. I understand there's an absolute need for regulation, uh, but we, we don't emphasize that. What we do do, though, is we obviously respect and understand that regulation is necessary. So anytime we're engaging in, in a project, we will consult with the NERCs and FERCs of the world and make sure we're not um, you know, compromising any of the guidance that's out there. And those are in, obviously, the places where that types of guidance will apply. And there are some major gaps out there in certain subsectors where there isn't really any type of compliance regimen out there. And, and for that, you know, people are uh, resorting to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Again, uh, non-regulated, non-regulatory um, by any means, and a, a very decent way to simplify uh, an overall approach and assessment of, of cybersecurity in, in your own individual organization. So if I had to say two things, Rob, would be number one, primarily we're non-regulatory, and number two, NCCOE stood up um, directly for this type of engagement. Great. You know, having recently you know, had a role at a, a regulated utility, uh, that was uh, a relieving statement to hear you uh, describe the, the role that NCCOE plays. Uh, and that, you know, uh, 
a utility, for example, could absolutely leverage uh, the NCCOE without any uh, fear of being audited by them, so to speak. Um, so, you know, that being said, that really leads me into my next question here. Um, you know, for those of us that uh, this might be our first exposure to the center and, and its offerings, uh, can you describe how a cybersecurity professional uh, might go about leveraging your offerings to secure their industrial environment? Yeah, sure. I, and, you know, the world of cybersecurity professionals is made up of folks. Um, there's a lot of different flavors and, and, and positions out there. There's policy-level folks. There's tech-level folks. And there's, you know, folks who, who go back and forth from, you know, tech um, to project management thing and, and things. So the way I would say the best way to approach it from a, a holistic standpoint is if you take a look at our guide, the way our guides are designed, they were designed with that understanding in mind. There's going to be a lot of different people with a lot of different viewpoints coming at cybersecurity and having their own unique interest in, in whatever they need to find out. So the way our practice guides are set up, as I mentioned, Part A, the executive summary, Part B, um, the approach, the architecture, the rationale for doing the build, the security requirements, um, things like that, the securing of the security, in fact, um, that's going to be really good, in my opinion, for CISO-level folks and for project management folks and even some of the technical folks as well. Um, so you have all different types of cybersecurity people who can look at that and benefit greatly from understanding what's, what's in there. And then I'd say Part C is really for the tech-level implementation guys. I'd say, you know, the ICS engineers of the world, the guys who are actually living in the trench-level stuff day-to-day, not necessarily the power optimization guys. You won't find a lot of guidance on, on um, energy optimization or things like that. Uh, what you'll find is how to secure things that, that uh, perform those processes for the grid and whatnot. The same thing would be true, I would say, in manufacturing, uh, probably even in transportation as well. So, you know, in any industry or sector where ICS is deployed or employed, um, you will find that the guides try to uh, give as a wide berth as possible to, to whatever viewpoints are considered. Um, and that's the way I would, I would look at uh, our offerings in terms of what they, can, uh, what they can offer in terms of overall cybersecurity. Yeah, great to know that you've got the, the whole gamut covered regardless of what role one might play in an organization. Um, yeah, moving I, on to – go ahead. Sorry, Rob, I just want to mention one thing quickly, you know, from the previous question, that's, and, and part of the other question tackles, you know, what actually are you doing? The most important thing to remember is that we're focused on the technology. We're not focused on policy procedure. We do fully realize that, you know, new policies and procedures can, can come as a result of implementing cybersecurity technology, but it's really important to emphasize uh, to the audience as well that we're primarily focused on technology. So thanks. Pardon me. No, great clarification there. Um, so, you know, prior to working on our, our talk, you know, I spent some time taking a look at the NCCOE's use cases on your website. And uh, it's plain to see, of course, that they're separated by sector. And uh, I spent some time, you know, discovering those offerings that were available and, and several things stood out to me. Of course, being that my focus at Tripwire is helping our customers secure their industrial environments where, of course, energy manufacturing and the transportation sectors are huge components. Could you talk a little bit about the efforts that you and your team have put into the respective case studies like asset management and situational awareness and capabilities assessment for securing manufacturing industrial control systems? Yeah, definitely. Um, again, I would defer back to a slide in the definition stage, what are we trying to do? What exactly is our purpose? Who are we trying to serve here? So NIST being NIST, it was kind of, uh, you know, when the center first started, and obviously in the past six years, we've built huge contact lists and whatnot, and, uh, you know, lists of folks who are very trusted, who, who believe in the mission and what we're trying to do, and who hopefully will benefit it at some point. But we do, you know, every time that we are looking to do a new project, we always begin by soliciting ideas from the people who will be affected most by it. And there's any number of, of people in any different organization, in energy, manufacturing, wherever it may be, who may stand to benefit um, at, you know, from 
from the uh, implementation of one of these guides. So that's the primary focus. It's basically, what is your most, what is your biggest problem? We don't like to tell people what problems they have. We like to ask them and then basically provide the necessary resources to take that information, turn it into a project, in this case a, take, a, a specific technology implementation or I should say groups of technology uh, implementations, and then finally publish the results. So whatever sector you're looking at, and, and one of the things you'll find on our website as well is that we're not necessarily limited to sectors. We have things, uh, use cases are more synonymous with sectors. We also have things called building blocks, which are, um, just to give an example, mobile device security. Now that's a problem across the board, not just specific to any, any given sector. So we have uh, technology builds going on in areas like that. Derived PIV is another example of that, et cetera, et cetera. So again, just getting back to your core question here, Rob, that is the key way that we go about um, standing up one of these projects and ultimately publishing the guidance that we do. It's really kind of a ground level effort with the people that, uh, that we're looking to get the information from and ultimately serve um, with the publishing of one of these guides. And that's how it all starts. You know, I'm, I'm just one data point, uh, but if you want to add it to your tally here, I can tell you that uh, the use cases, you know, that we've been talking about today absolutely do hit the, the pain points of a vast majority of, of customers that we interact with on a daily basis. So fantastic job in taking the pulse of the industry and their needs. Uh, we'll move on to the, the next question here. Um, and really, this, this does go back to uh, your slide on the NCCOE tenants that really stood out to me, particularly the fact that you've focused on delivering standards-based or standards-compatible implementation documentation, and the fact that you leverage commercially available technology to address the challenges that we're all facing. Would it be a fair statement that the NCCOE is a good starting point for our audience who may be taking a first leap into securing their industrial networks? Yeah, I, I would say um, it's, it's a great starting point. I mean, there's any number of places to start, but I would say more so from the standpoint um, if you have a particular problem that you're looking at. So I, I would go to my situation awareness use case. I mean. That's very fundamental, as is identity and access management. I would say from a situation awareness standpoint, what do you really want to know about what's going on in your environment? So take a look at what we've published there. But at the same time, too, you know, every, just about every talk that I give these days always encompasses mention of the cybersecurity framework. Um, and again, cybersecurity framework is really designed um, to be usable by individuals or you know, individual business owners or large companies, whatever it may be, who believe they have the need to uh, add protection or at least assess their ability to protect their own uh, assets. And this, I'm talking, when I talk about assets, I talk about OT primarily, and then IT and then physical access like uh, plant and building and whatnot. So given that, Rob, I think you know, the question is a good one and there's any number of ways to start, but if you're trying to get off the ground to even determine what you need, I'd say refer to the cybersecurity framework. Each one of our use cases always has a reference to the CSF, which in and of itself is not a standard, right? It's going to point to um, other NIST and other relevant standards, applicable standards, whether industry-based or um, just uh, you know general private sector stuff. but you'll obviously find a, a heavy NIST element in there. Any one of the CS cybersecurity framework families or groups um, is going to always point back at the very least to our 853 uh, family of controls, regardless of, of what industry or sector we're talking about. So I think that's a really good place to start for people who are just getting uh, any type of cybersecurity effort fledgling off the ground. And once you get to uh, different levels of maturity, complexity, whatever they may be, um, you can still stand to benefit, uh, obviously, from what's in the guidance. They're going to range in complexity. Uh, the stuff that I'm doing in particular with manufacturing and energy, uh, I would say, are pretty much at a fundamental level. Great. Thanks, Jim. And, you know, I can say that, you know, 
your, your re reference to the cybersecurity frameworks, frameworks is, of course, uh, right up Tripwire's alley. So we, we absolutely uh, cater to those capabilities and, and helping our customers uh, align accordingly. So moving on to the, the next question here. Um, you, uh, the engagement and business model uh, described in, in your slides earlier, again, does a, a really good job of, of describing the cycle uh, that you and your team goes through to develop uh, a deliverable. But that being said, uh, I, of course, noticed that some of the studies we've talked about are still in draft form or still in an information gathering state. Can you describe the life cycle of one of these projects, particularly like in the assemble and build stages? Yeah, sure. So uh, we'll, I'll, I'll need to defer to the define stage first. So just take it as it were from the define stage. You have a problem. You've defined it. Um, your constituency is happy with, with the fact that you're planning on moving forward with it. What's the next step? Well, once we define what our problem is, we have to define exactly what we're going to do about it. And that happens in the form of a project description, right? So primarily, and I'll use energy sector asset management since that's the most recent one and it's probably the best example to use because folks will actually see this if they visit the website. We drafted a project description, I would say, I think it was late December when it first came out. Um, I'm sorry, no, uh, we actually were commenting on it. But so first we put things down on paper and basically we want to explain to anybody out there, whether they be a tech vendor uh, or an interested party of any sort, we want to describe what our intention of doing on this project is to get at least more consensus, but if, if anything else, to generate comments on whether we're hitting the mark overall. So we draft this project description. We send it out. In our case, for asset management, it was a 30-day comment period. We get all the comments back and we adjudicate them. So what does that primarily serve? The first is a sanity check. Are we, are we focusing on the right thing now that we're spread out to a larger audience? I mean, generally anybody can, can comment on these and send in comments. And we got a lot on asset management. One of the, the reassuring things we received from the field is that we're doing the right thing. However, they'd like to see us emphasize this more, that less, you know, certain characteristics, uh, things like that. So it tends to be an iterative, iterative process, which at all times, when we're, when we're still determining what to do, is, is uh, we're consulting with um, who we believe to be stakeholders at every step of the way. So at a certain point, you've got to put an end to that type of activity and basically go out and start doing it. And that's what um, the stage that we're in right now, the Federal Register notices, the call for collaboration, right? So we're not accepting calls for collaboration from anyone other than um, people who have the technology to support and, and create the build. And the build is the assemble phase, right? So we, uh, the, the Federal Register says, here's the capabilities we need. If you have a tool that you believe meets these security requirements, please send our letter of interest in and we will consider it for uh, use in our particular build. The build is uh, connecting all the tech pieces to demonstrate the solution so that we can then go about writing about it. And that's really the, the whole assemble phase in a nutshell. And mind you, all throughout this process, plenty of folks who want to collaborate. The tech vendors, though, it's a more formal agreement than anyone else who just uh, seems to be an interested party or a stakeholder. On that level, we ask them to sign a collaborative research and development agreement with NIST, no money's ever exchanged hands, so they're giving us their tech expertise, their products, hardware, software for free on every, any given build, and then uh, we do all the building here with their help, of course, and do all the writing, or most of it, I should say. So it's a completely collaborative process the entire way. Awesome, Jim, thank you. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time, I think, uh, from the vendor perspective, uh, but if a given entity or end user or implementer was interested in having the NCCOE address a particular cybersecurity challenge in their environment, and they wanted to leverage the capabilities, of course, of commercially available products, and of course they're you know conforming to one or several cybersecurity frameworks or trying to, how would they go about uh, getting a project adopted uh, to be 
by the NCCUE, and, and what's the likelihood of, of you guys moving forward with it? Uh, good question. So primarily what, what we're looking at, I think what you meant was basically how do they get a project initiated with the NCCUE? Well, first and foremost, we get a lot of ideas already. How they do it is any number of means of communication on the website, my contact information, whatever it may be. We have teams of people that work in these separate sectors. So that if someone wants to make contact with us, they're not going to have a problem doing that at all. Now, as far as us adopting their idea for the potential for a project, then we take whatever ideas that they have, discuss it with them, and then we float it out to the community at large. That's why we have these communities of interest. We need to build consensus on these ideas with a larger group of people than, let's say, just one in order to make it viable. We don't want to serve individual particular interests. That's not our charter at all. And usually, Rob, we don't have a problem doing that because if, you know, from what we've seen, uh, the interests of one are, are truly and actually the interests of many out there. But we test that. We test that by communicating with these large communities that we have to say, would this be a worthwhile endeavor uh, to move forward with? And typically, you know, we'll get the responses on that. Then we measure the amount of resources we can devote and allocate to it. And then from there, it just kind of takes on its own. In fact, uh, another good example is energy sector asset management started out with the intention of doing something along the supply chain. Uh, NIST was coming, I'm sorry, not NIST, but NERC had some pending uh, guidance coming out uh, on supply chain management and supply chain security management, things like that. And one of the folks brought that to us, say, Jim, you know, NERC is coming out with this guidance. We might want to address or, or focus on a project that would that would be amiable towards uh, helping industry uh, take a look at that picture. Well, from that entire conversation, the energy sector asset management project is, is what was born of that. And why? Because supply chain is a problem for everybody. It's a problem for energy. It's a problem for government. Uh, those challenges are not unique to any one given sector, although the nuances uh, therein are in, in some cases, in many cases. But for us to take on that big of a problem with so many components was a little bit too much to tackle. So we decided as a group that we were going to focus on uh, asset management for the energy sector with the concentration and focus on, on the things, as I mentioned, you know, the remote assets, the uh, geographically dispersed assets, things like that. So uh, that's how one of these ideas goes from idea from an individual to fruition in terms of a final product. Uh, so we can't do every idea that's out there, but we tr do the ones that will obviously benefit and serve the most people, according to what we can determine. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Um, we got one more question from the audience. I think it's a, uh, appropriate to slide in at this point, and uh, that is, how does the NCCOE interact with national research labs such as Oak Ridge? Uh, there's no direct program of interaction, but I can safely say that the interaction, uh, for example, the folks out in the Pacific Northwest uh, National Laboratories, they, you know, we've uh, had them speak with us at conferences, uh, things like that. So it's more a of a coll informal collaborative relationship than anything else. We don't have any formal partnerships with these folks in place. We're not, we are completely open to doing that, but we see. Uh, a lot of parallel in their efforts to what we're doing as well. And uh, it's, it's more so consultative and advice giving and collaborating on, on demonstrating particular aspects of cybersecurity. So that is a great question. I'm glad that individual asked that because we have a, an example of that. Uh, just this past October, we were up at uh, GridSecCon in Minneapolis. We had uh, Dr. Mark Rice speak with us um, showing what he's doing from his uh, PNNL uh, standpoint, uh, which basically was similar to some of the efforts we're undertaking at the NCCOE. So that's essentially the extent of it right now. Great. Yeah, I, I happened to be there, and that, that was a great talk. Um, oh, thanks. Jim, go ahead. Oh, you're good. I'm, that's oh. fine. Are there any other questions, okay. Rob? Yeah, it looks like uh, perhaps another one just came in here. Let's see. Uh, another a similar one. Uh, does the NCCE coordinate with the DHS NCCIC, like 
uh, ICS CERT and US CERT, for example? No, there's no direct coordination uh, with those organizations individually, uh, only because that we are not really equipped to tackle that mission space. You have a completely different mission space there that's focused on anti-terrorism. Uh, definitely cybersecurity is a part of it, and we understand that, but those guys are, are the true situation awareness experts, and uh, obviously we will, there's, there's going to be some overlap between the two entities. We're dealing purely on the technology level, or at least we try to. Um, there's obviously always going to be some natural overlap, but there's no direct coordination on any of this. I will say, however, um, a couple of important things. When it comes to reviewing the guidance that we're putting out, it always is accompanied by uh, whenever we are getting ready to put documentation out, especially where it mentions other entities' compliance guidance. So we have folks at NERC who will review our guide to say, Jim, this looks great. It's not contradicting or, or uh, it comports to what we're trying to do out there, and it obviously does not contradict any NERC compliance guidance out there. So in that regard, yes, we're very respectful of other people's mission spaces. We are in the pure cybersecurity technology mission space, but we also are, you know, asking the right questions when we need to ask them, but no direct uh, engagement with NKIC and the ICS CERT. But we definitely use their information. In fact, I went to the ICS CERT training out in uh, Idaho Falls about a year and a half ago. It was phenomenal. Great. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, thanks for spending time with me today in our audience, Jim. Uh, it was a pleasure learning more about the NCCOE and perhaps even dispelling some preconceived notions that I may have had. Uh, I look forward to working with you and your team in the near future. Uh, Tripwire, I know, hopes to contribute to the uh, upcoming proposed project to enhance the energy sector's asset management capabilities uh, for OT. Uh, and that being said, uh, now I'd like to just spend some, some time to introduce Tripwire's uh, industrial solutions suite. Thank you very um, much, Rob, first off, and thank you all for listening. Now, oh, thank you, Jim. So um, I think a quick Tripwire introduction is appropriate. Uh, Tripwire delivers advanced security compliance and IT OT solutions. Uh, we're a stable company in what is really a chaotic industry full of startups, mergers, and divestitures, uh, particularly so in the ICS cybersecurity space. Um, we're part of a, a $3 billion company with a 100-year history uh, in Belden. And, you know, while we've been providing inter the enterprise with award-winning technology to keep them secure and compliant for more than 20 years now, uh, and we're trusted by thousands of customers since 1997. Uh, a few cool stats um, include the fact that we have thousands of successful customer deployments with more than 20 million endpoints covered around the globe. Uh, to go along with that comes a pretty decent customer satisfaction survey, uh, along with the fact that we're trusted uh, by over half of the Fortune 500. So uh, here's just an uh, abbreviated history of Tripwire, again, of course, having been founded in 1997, coming from very strong file integrity monitoring routes. Uh, we've complemented our capabilities uh, with the introduction of additional tools in configuration assessment, login, security and event management, and of course, vulnerability management. Uh, most recently, Tripwire was acquired by Belden, again, furthering uh, and strengthening our commitment to helping our industrial customers secure their environments. For security, uh, we provide the most foundational controls included in industry standard frameworks like uh, NIST, uh, which is particularly relevant for today's talk, but also uh, CIS, NERC, ISA, and others. And uh, we help organizations get more coverage with automated workflows and integrations, making it really easy to deploy uh, and manage their environments. For compliance, we've got the most extensive policy library in the industry uh, with more than 800 combinations of platforms and regulatory standards. And we help maintain compliance over time with monitoring and audit evidence and reports uh, to reduce uh, workload during an audit, for example. For IT operations, we help manage uh, infrastructure and configurations to the state you need. 
and manage changes to control unauthorized changes that are the root cause for downtime on the plant floor. You know, contrary uh, to popular belief, it's typically not the, the hackers um, getting into these environments. It's a mistake made by a controls engineer, for example. Uh, but it's definitely more fun to talk about the hackers. So uh, this unfortunately didn't build out, but you get the idea there. Uh, this slide does a great job uh, at introducing our ICS cyber resiliency solution, which is uh, depicted on the, the lower arc here. It really is complemented by our cyber integrity suite, which is depicted on the, the upper arc. Uh, so the blue section in the middle is, is the core of our cyber resiliency capabilities that highlights Tripwire Enterprise. Most people, again, know us for file integrity monitoring. Uh, change detection was our first product, and uh, we're still the best in the industry at detecting integrity changes, and not just on files, but things like programmable logic controller firmware versions and their settings and their programming. Um, Tripwire Enterprise can be leveraged to help avoid plant downtime by giving operators the visibility into their systems that perhaps they previously hadn't been capable of. Another component of uh, Tripwire Enterprise is policy and configuration assessment uh, added to our core capability to make it more robust and useful and added automation to reduce the workload associated with, with compliance management. The green section to the left depicts our vulnerability management capabilities with IP360. Um, combined with asset discovery, it boasts the industry's most precise risk scoring algorithm so you can set actionable priorities layered on top of change detection and configuration assessment and change management, you know, making it uh, easier to help uh, your administrators draw your, their attention to what be, might be most pertinent and most vulnerable in their environment. Uh, the purple wedge on the right refers to Tripwire Log Center, which adds log management capabilities to the mix. It helps make sense of the data generated by PLCs and HMIs and the SCADA environment along with, you know, engineering workstations, for example. On the far right-hand side, you can see that Belden's products uh, and their portfolio really helps complement um, our solution with their industrial network here, for example, to help isolate your plant's network from the business land and uh, help you stand up zones and conduits, for example, and, and help protect uh, endpoints like PLCs that Sadly, uh, we're not designed in such a way that they could even begin to protect themselves. Um, so we've, we've integrated all these capabilities to work together seamlessly for real risk detection, uh, give it, giving us a huge amount of insight into the industrial environment. Um, and finally, we have an open architecture so we can exchange our unique asset state data uh, with many of the most used vendors in the, the OT security space, so really vendor agnostic. Um, with that, um, thank you for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. Kate, I'd like to turn it over to you to see if there's uh, any remaining questions, but uh, both Jim and I look forward to working with, with folks in the future, and you know, feel free again to, to reach out to us uh, directly should you have any questions. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I would like to thank both of our presenters today, Jim McCarthy and Robert Landavazzo. Thank you, gentlemen, for all of your great information. And thank you to our audience for attending today. We hope that you found the presentation informative and useful to you. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of this webcast. And if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for the webinar, please respond to that follow-up email. We hope you'll join us for future webcasts. Check out our schedule on tripwire.com. Also check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security, to find out the latest in security news as well as thought-provoking security topics. Thank you and have a great day.